Who is the mysterious figure that Jacob wrestles with in the middle of the night and a scene that is one of the most influential parts of his life trajectory? Today, we have a special guest with us, Dr. Daniel Bunn, who did a significant part of his PhD research on this subject. Daniel, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. Yeah, good to have you. So let's dive right in. I think this is a story that many people wonder, what's going on with this? Uh, you know, whether you're reading in English, Hebrew, or whatever language, this is a fascinating story and a mysterious one. So before we we get into the, the main part of your research, can you just kind of set the scene for us, make sure we're on the same page uh, about who is Jacob, what makes him an important uh, character in Genesis, and specifically catch us up to speed on this wrestling scene? Like, what what, what is the scene? Yeah, so Jacob, well-known figure, of course, the one who'll be renamed Israel, uh, that, that name first showing up in this passage, but uh, Jacob, the son of Isaac and Rebecca, the twin brother of Esau. Uh, from the very first episodes in his life, there's this tension between him and his brother. Uh, in fact, uh, as, as they're born, uh, they come out and Jacob's clinging to his brother's heel from which his name comes. Um, so uh, also, though, interesting, when, uh, when Rebecca's pregnant with the twins, readers learn, and Rebecca learns, sort of, so a bit ambiguous, but uh, while, while the children are in utero, that the, uh, the older will serve the younger. So readers have a little bit of an insight into the, the dynamics that will be present between these two brothers. Uh, shortly after two well-known episodes, uh, he steals his brother's birthright for a bowl of some sort of stew. And then uh, along with his mother, they, they cooperate to steal his brother's blessing from their father, Isaac. Uh, that prompts uh, the, the, the first dramatic move in his life where he flees uh, the danger of his brother uh, to live with Laban, his mother's family. And uh, it is in that portion of his life where for, he's, out, he's with, with that family for decades. He marries his wives. He has his children. He gathers flocks. He gathers herds. Uh, and then in chapter 31, God calls to him and tells him to go back home, go to the land of his fathers. So that sets in motion the next phase in his journey, uh, his journey back to the land of Canaan. So he sets out and on the way after he after some uh, interesting uh, episodes with his father-in-law, Laban, uh, he sent, he turns immediately back to the tension that's sort of undergirded the whole story uh, between him and his brother. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so he sends some messengers ahead to, to see how things are with his brother, uh, you know, to test the waters, so to speak. He, uh, the messengers he had sent come back and report to him that Esau is on the way with 400 men, uh, an ambiguous though ominous detail. Uh, Jacob takes this uh, as, as a threat and he fears for his life. And so it's in the midst of this fearful anticipation uh, of the encounter with his brother uh, that this wrestling match takes place. So setting up the scene in particular, uh, Jacob sends his wives, his children, his possessions, everything ahead of him and between himself and Esau. And then it is out of nowhere in that moment as he's left alone that uh, the narrator informs readers that a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And so uh, obviously, however you, you, you cut it, whatever interpretation you take of this opponent, mystery enshrouds the narrative uh, in, this, in particular, this opponent's identity. And so uh, then after this math, this, this wrestling match, uh, in chapter 33, we have the face-to-face -face encounter in the daylight with his brother, and then that will <clears throat> be followed by his, his return to the land of Canaan. So that, that's what sets up uh, this wrestling match. Well, first, that's an excellent summary. I find that, that yeah, very you good. Know, we know, we know <laughs> about biblical characters whether from preaching, teaching, or books, but we only know scenes. We don't realize how do all the scenes fit together chronologically? <laughs> What's the narrative? So first off, thank you for just a great narrative take yeah. on just Jacob's Jacob's life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's interesting there too. I was thinking about it as I was reading the text last night. So Jacob is uh, obviously in fear of what Esau might do to him. And he actually prays to the Lord, doesn't he? That, that the Lord had promised to do good to him in that mm -hmm. particular uh, aspect uh, moment. And is expecting this outcome with his brother to end in that particular way. 
sending the different gifts, it seems. Is that right? Uh, ahead of him, hopefully, as an appeasement of some sort, or at least to maybe break down the barrier that might exist between him and Esau. So it's quite fascinating on that point. So um, I have a question for you here. Uh, what yeah. What are the? Let's just jump right in. Then, what are the main theories of who Jake, uh, of whom Jacob wrestled with, and what problems do you see with those particular theories? So let's just jump right into to your research on that level. So yeah, yeah. So um, as is the case with some of these more complex and mysterious stories, that an abundance of possible interpretations. Um, in, in my framing of it. I categorize the main main interpretations that have sort of held any sway uh, under two categories. Um, and again, I'll, I'll even touch on some of the other variances or, or divergences from those here in a moment. But the main two theories, uh, more or less, uh, they coalesce around these two options. Uh, the first one is that Jacob wrestles with God, capital G, or a God, maybe some sort of Canaanite God, but but in some sense, uh, God. The second main interpretation is that he wrestles with some other non-human being, but also non-divine, uh, perhaps for, for lack of a better word, uh, what we might think of when we hear the word angel, though, of course, the Hebrew word and the Greek word angel, a little more nuanced than we might uh, bring to, to that word, but this sort of non-human being who's, who's, who's uh, you know, some, somewhere between God and human um, in mm. terms of uh, you know, power and ability and, and so forth. So, so we'll use angel. So th those are the two main interpretations. Uh, and so to begin with that first one, the, the main, the main support for this option that Jacob wrestles with God or, or a God of some sort, uh, the main support for this textually comes from the mouth of Jacob himself. So at the end of this wrestling match, after Jacob has survived and the man has fled, has fled, uh, Jacob names the place Penny Ale, which in Hebrew, face of God. And he says, so the etiology he gives for that place is, for I saw God face to face and my life was preserved. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I saw God face to face, my life was preserved. In other words, Jacob seems to conclude that his opponent is God. Now, in my digging, this becomes the main textual support for identifying this opponent as God. Jacob says it was God. Uh, now, the main problem I see with this interpretation uh, is that to imagine that the God revealed throughout Genesis up to this point, or the God revealed elsewhere in Scripture, or even if we want to talk about some Canaanite deity, would be unable to overcome Jacob in a physical battle is a bit of a challenge from my perspective. Um, now, when I say that the opponent couldn't overcome Jacob, I'm referring to something in the text itself. Um, in the text, as the two are fighting, the narrator tells readers uh, that the, the, the uh, opponent here who's fighting him saw that he could not overcome. Now, that's just a simple note from the narrator to readers. It's not, uh, you know, it's just a direct statement about this from, from the perspective of this opponent. He has a moment of realization that he cannot overcome Jacob. So whatever we make of the text, we have to conclude that the narrator is pointing us to an opponent who is unable to overcome Jacob, which again, for me, uh, is a bit of a stretch to imagine that being God as revealed in who, who the God who's revealed in Genesis up to this point. Um, a couple of other details of, about this text that to me again just seem problematic with this interpretation. Um, one of the main ones is the text also emphasizes after the opponent realizes he can't overcome Jacob, uh, it emphasizes that the opponent desires to flee from Jacob before daybreak. Um, that's a curious detail to mention. Yeah. You know, let me go for the day is breaking. Mm -hmm. um, now, if this were God, then we might ask as readers, why would God desire to flee before daybreak? Um, and in fact, the attempts, both popular and academic, to handle this detail uh, betray its strangeness. Uh, for instance, one scholar concludes that this detail of the text, this desire to flee before daybreak, it represents the influence of ancient river demon mythology, <laughs> whereby a mysterious demon guarded a river but lost its power with the rising of the sun. 
So in other words, God is a vampire. Uh, <laughs> God loses his power when the sun comes up. So the desire to flee, therefore, is explained as <clears throat> the desire to flee uh, before the sun rises. I mean, I suppose that's possible, uh, but minimally, <laughs> is... you know, it, it's strange to imagine something like that creeping into the scriptures of Israel. Um, and, and then just final one more point, and then I'll pause and ask if you have any questions. Um, we, another thing to keep in mind, and this is one of my main areas of emphasis, is how the narrator is present, even if sort of uh, behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, and so far in this narrative and beyond this point, even, the narrator only refers to this opponent as Ish, a man. Uh, now, again, that word is open to flexible interpretations, but that's the, that's all the narrator has provided us hmm. so far. We might imagine if the narrator had some other person or some other entity in mind, such, uh, you know, a, a, an example uh, that many call to mind when I share this theory is uh, the infamous Genesis 18 account, uh, where the three men approach Abraham before right. Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, but there, the narrator eventually clarifies for readers who those men are. Mm -hmm. um, that, that never comes in this text. So anyway, so those are, those are sort of some, let me just, I'll pull that together, kind of throwing a lot out there. Um, to summarize, the main reason for concluding that the opponent is God is Jacob's own statement. And the main problems arise from my perspective, from the text itself, because whoever the opponent is, he A, is un unable to overcome Jacob, B, desires to flee before daybreak, and C, is only called a man by the narrator. And so surely these would be strange to attribute to the God revealed through Genesis. So I'll pause there if you have any, any questions or anything before I share the second main interpretation. Anything for you me to keep going or? <clears throat> uh, excellent. No, I thought that was, I thought that was, I, thought, I think that's very good uh, with the theories uh, coming forth and um, I, you know, I, I do have this one. What, what is the consequence of this scene for the narrative so far um, with this wrestling thing? I mean, in all the research that you've done um, on this particular scene, it, it, it's sort of one of those, those, those moments in scripture where it, it's like, okay, now we're, we're suddenly in a wrestling <laughs> match here. <laughs> and why is this happening? I, I guess before we get really to your interpretation, especially um, mm -hmm. in, in everything that you have studied, well, did, a, did, did, it, did it come to you that there is real consequential weight to this moment um, in the narrative and, and why? why? Why do you think that is so? Yeah, I think with this first theory, and it'll be similar for the second theory that I'm about to share, but if this is God in particular, but even if it's an angel of sorts, um, this text becomes uh, in, in many ways a turning point, as many have interpreted this. I mean, I've heard many a sermon on this text, beautiful sermons, um, even if we ultimately might disagree on some of the interpretations, <laughs> but it becomes a moment where Jacob is, is, you know, even at a metaphorical level, wrestling with God, uh, and then comes out a changed man. Mm -hmm. um, in light of the theory I'm going to propose here in a second, the consequences change, though I still think it becomes a consequential episode in the narrative for different reasons. Um, so I might have to come back to that once I've sort of laid out my theory. But uh, yeah, but yeah cer certainly if this is God, this becomes uh, a significant turning point in his life. Um, so I, I will say in either, either in my theory, it will be significant as well. It, it will still be significant as well. Yeah. Just for right, right, right. So, so either way in this particular scene, something drastic happens in Jacob's life. Yes. Uh, no matter yes. which, which interpretation we go. Yeah. Very good. I, I will, I will argue that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let me go ahead and share the second main interpretation and then uh, yeah. we can, we can reflect on those more generally, and then mm -hmm. I can open up my theory. Uh, so the, the second option, again, as I said earlier, is that Jacob wrestles some sort of non-human being or angel. Um, the main support for this comes not from Genesis 32 itself, uh, but from a combination of, one, hesitancy people might have with identifying this opponent as God, and two, from Hosea 12. Mm. Um, Hosea, in, in, who's seemingly referring to this passage, says at one point, Hosea 12, it's four or five, the, the verse ordering, I, I, it's different in English than in Hebrew, so I, I forget mm -hmm. which one's which. I think it's verse five. 
Uh, he strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. So Hosea, using the same vocabulary from this wrestling message, strive and prevail, here identifies the one with whom Jacob wrestled as Hebrew malach, so angel or messenger. Uh, so these two details combined uh, have pointed some readers to a non-human, non-divine opponent. Mm. Um, this opinion is, when I started my research, surprised me. Um, it, it's not a popular, uh, it, it's not a popular choice among uh, academics, uh, but it seems like it's more at a, at a pop level, you know, in the culture, uh, this is the, the preferred interpretive option. Even you too, Bono, uh, <laughs> talks about Jacob wrestling the angel. Um, and, and so just yeah. at a popular level, when people refer to Jacob wrestling, they will say the angel. Um, it, it actually wasn't one of the main um, more contemporary academic interpretations, though some, um, you know, er earlier generations did go with this option. Um, mm. But so, so that's the second option. And he, he wrestled with an angel. Um, now, some of my concerns with this one, uh, several of which are the same from the previous interpretation. Um, mm. I mean, if the main impetus for identifying this opponent as an angel is that it's easier to wrap your mind around Jacob overcoming an angel than God. Um, my question is, have you read any of the passages that have these sort of non-human beings present in them? They definitely don't seem any more likely to be overcome by Jacob. Um, maybe <laughs> yeah. you know, when we're talking infinitely yeah. uh, in terms That's of God, um, but I, I don't feel like it really resolves any of those issues. <clears throat> And then uh, further, again, just th there's nothing in the text itself that that points in this direction uh, other than, you know, looking outside and then allowing that to affect how we read what's inside the passage. Um, yeah. So th those are the main two interpretations, uh, you know, that, that it's either God or an angel. And both for me have some of the similar raise the similar issues. Um just a quick rundown of some of the other variants on that, and then we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, some have said that Jacob is perhaps dreaming in this episode or in some sort of vision state. Um, others have argued he's wrestling internally at maybe a psychological level. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then even I, I read one interpretation uh, from a rabbinic source that says he's wrestling the guardian angel of Esau. So making it a little more specific, mm. but still angel. Anyway. Yeah. So that's a brief rundown of some of the, the main interpretations mm. of this opponent's identity. Um, so before I move on to, to share my own, any, any thoughts from you all, any questions? Well, I mean, it's just, it's just an interesting point. As you say, in Hosea, uh, they use the word malach uh, to say who, who he wrestled with. And mm -hmm. it's the only two parts of the Bible that talk about this story. And mm -hmm. so I, once again, I just, I think you chose a good PhD topic because like you said, this is in Shroud <laughs> Mystery and there's just enough, a little thing here, a little thing there, a little thing there that just makes you once again, wonder who is this person. So I don't yeah. know if I have any questions at this point. I, other than just I do. I, I have one question before we move on the night scene. Is there any importance with the fact that this is in darkness uh, and not when the light has come. So, I, and maybe there's not, but I'm just curious if there was anything thematically that is important to, to share before we get in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think again, either interpretation, I, I think uh, situated within the, the larger narrative uh, in, in particular, the life of Jacob, um, every single episode has involved either literal and or metaphorical darkness. Mm. Uh, as, as a as a, mm. uh, a foil or as a, a even a plot point a motif um so you know back to the first first few episodes we have jacob uh and his father who is virtually in darkness he can't see yeah that's a good point uh, yep then we have um jacob with his wives <laughs> the, the night of his marriage he, he's with the wrong right. woman um it, it's just one episode after the other involves someone being in the dark again either mm -hmm. literally or metaphorically and it's about one person one-upping the other, um, duping them uh, by way of the darkness. And so it, it, it's not surprising then in this particular narrative uh, to, to see darkness as, as, you know, this sort of ambiguity that comes with being in the dark. And now I would argue 
the narrative has taken us readers into the darkness. Uh, we don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, whatever you make mm -hmm. of this interpretation, there's clearly ambiguity built into this text. And so we're in the dark. We're there wrestling with Jacob and we have no idea what's going on. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it's like we've been outsiders watching others wander around in the darkness so far. And now we are participants. <laughs> we're in the darkness. Mm, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's in intriguing. So yeah. interesting. It is. It is. Yeah. These narratives are wonderful like that. It's very beautiful writing. So, um, yeah. well, this brings us to the point. All right, here it is. So who do you think this wrestler is? Yes. Yes. So, and, and as I, as I go into this, I, I always like to preface this with, you know, part, part of my, uh, my journey, um, is, the, the bigger concern I, I am hoping to to address and engage even in my research is in, in many ways, it, it's become my experience through uh, looking at research on various topics that um, partly because the narrator, as this is presented in the biblical text, is so behind the scenes by default. I mean, rarely does the biblical narrator just interject and offer explicit guidance or instruction on how to understand or how to feel about certain certain events. Um, more often, it seems like the biblical narrator uh, is inclined just to present events. Um, and, and therefore, you know, it's almost like a, like modern cinema, where we know that a producer has crafted this product to, to have an effect on us, but they rarely pop up on the screen and tell us what to think <laughs> or feel. Uh, they just let it work on us. Um, Similarly, I think often in the biblical narrative, we get these sorts of episodes where we don't have the narrator telling us what to think or feel. Um, and what that can do is cause readers to overlook the presence of the narrator and forget that we are, in fact, the readers of a story being told to us. And that sometimes the narrator, even though not explicitly in our face uh, with details, the narrator may be guiding us subtly in, in how to read texts. Um, so that's sort of my bigger interest. Um, when it comes to this particular passage, I recognize, uh, you know, th this is a, a theory that's, it, I, I, as far as I could find, no one else is arguing, um, which I always think is either a good thing or a terrible thing. Um, <laughs> it's either so bad that no one has argued it before, um, or I'm actually onto something interesting to think about. But I put it forward lightly, um, knowing that, again, it may have its own problems, uh, but I, I, th I think it's a helpful practice in exploring uh, how sometimes if we look again closely at familiar texts, we might see some things that we had overlooked before mm. uh, and maybe stumble onto some new possible ways of reading texts. So mm. I offer that as sort of a, a preface that I, I, my goal isn't to convince everyone of my theory, um, but I, I still think it's a fun theory and it's a useful practice. So, well, I think what you're practicing said, though, yeah, I think what, what you're that? practicing, though. Yeah, I was going to say what you're practicing, I think, is a very fundamental aspect of deep research, which yeah. what we don't realize is sometimes beliefs or viewpoints we have in anything in life is just someone a long time ago said something, and then a lot someone else heard them say it. And that person who heard it said it to somebody else who said it to somebody else. Yeah. And so it's just, it's great when you have, especially, you know, in the academic research of the Bible, I think that's part of what we're trying to do is let's take another look at this or let's look at this in light of such and such thing. And I, again, I appreciate your humility. I think that's ideally how all of us should be yeah, as we approach what we do, a mixture of boldness and humility. Yeah. Uh, but I think this should encourage all of us that as we're going through text, just because you heard one person give one take on a certain passage, especially I think for, uh, let's say the person who their exposure to Bible teaching is only at church and they've had one pastor their whole life not trying to say anything bad about their pastor, maybe, but if their pastor has one take on this passage and that's just what they hear every year, you know, mm -hmm. there might be other ways to view things. And mm -hmm. so this might be a good opportunity for us as listeners to participate. And, and I hope it leads people to um, an imagination and excitement and realize that this shouldn't lead people to worry or concern, but instead this makes us feel excited about going back and looking at the Bible and getting to read again and, Realize that again, this draws us to the same God, obviously, but realizing what what what's being emphasized or nuanced here. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm I love what you're doing. I'm excited for you Absolutely. to share where your take is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I echo all those words right there that you just said. I think that's key. And in, in this text in particular, uh, you know, just 
as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the couple of the details in the text itself, it, it was interesting to go through this research process and engage these people who, who have IQs far above mine and uh, attention to detail that goes beyond what I could do. Even still, those scholars um, sometimes come to this text and they read a detail, for instance, such as um, when he saw that he could not overcome Jacob. And, and, and they will come away saying things like this. This is where God allowed Jacob to overcome him. And th that was curious to me because the text says nothing about <laughs> allowing. It's just sharing what the, the opponent realized. You know? And so, mm. again, as you, as you had said, it, it shows how, uh, especially with difficult texts, we often... Uh, we, we, we get something comfortable, some interpretation that's comfortable, and that can then in turn affect how we see the details of the text itself. Um, so whether someone agrees with me or not, I hope you know, those, those details I've already called attention to, along with some others, at least become uh, details worth exploring again um, that maybe had been overlooked before. So anyway, well, let me, let me jump in and I'll share my, my theory, and uh, then we can, we can get at it. So here is my theory. I propose that the clues within the text itself point, however ambiguously, to a human opponent. And then further, I will speculate that the most likely human opponent in this narrative is Jacob's own brother, Esau. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> so, yes. And as I said, as far as I could tell, the closest anyone has gotten to arguing this is uh, the, the source I mentioned earlier that talks about this being the guardian angel of Esau. Uh, as far as I've been able to tell, and I've looked for about 15 years now or more, well, coming up on, yeah, oh man, time flies by. Um, <laughs> I'm not finding anyone making this specific case. Um, but again, I, the text itself, I, I, I'm a little more confident points toward a human opponent. And then more at the, um, with a little more speculation, I'm arguing that opponent is Esau. So let me outline the main support that I've garnered for this theory. Uh, in, 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 in the process, each individual piece that, that comes that I, I use to support this theory it doesn't necessarily bear much weight by itself. Um, you know, it, it's not that there's just some earth shattering mm -hmm. individual detail, but it was more the cumulative weight of all these details that sort of pulled me in this direction. Um, so to begin, I, I want to just talk about why I think this is a human opponent more generally. And the main support for this, I think, are textual clues offered within the text by the narrator. Uh, so, uh, first of all, when the opponent appears, as I said earlier, the narrator calls him Ish, a man. And the narrator never clarifies, not, never, never provides an alternative interpretation, and in fact, avoids confirming Jacob's I, I, conclusion that this is God. The narrator never confirms that and kind of goes awkwardly out of his way in the Hebrew to avoid it. Um, second, the opponent being able to overcome Jacob, as I mentioned earlier, points most naturally to a human opponent, one who would be uh, more likely to be unable to overcome Jacob. And then third, the desire to flee before daybreak, which is a confusing detail if this is God or an angel, likewise makes the best sense if it were the desire of a human who remains to be unseen once the sun rises. So with these three pieces of, of information, I suggest that the narrator is pointing us to a human opponent. Called him a man, Anish. Uh, he cannot overcome Jacob, and he desires to flee before he is seen in uh, the daylight. Now, the, the potential problems with this part of my theory uh, first of all, Jacob calls him God. Uh, true, but the whole Jacob narrative, as I said already, is, 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 you know, involves deception or the inability to see properly. And again, we're talking about Jacob who mistook Leah for Rachel on his wedding night. So uh, in, in general, the premise I work from when I'm reading... It's a good text, point. It's a good point. It's, it's fair. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's, you know, it's debatable that he's always right. Um, so in, in general, the principle I work with when I'm reading a narrative in the Bible is that God and the narrator are trusted in scripture, but characters must be vetted more carefully. They can be wrong. So it wouldn't be surprising, in other words, if Jacob were wrong, uh, especially if his conclusion is in tension with the narrator's conclusion. Um, the second uh, is that the opponent renames Jacob and blesses him. This is another uh, problem that yeah. people have raised when they hear my theory. 
Um, I will discuss this a bit more fully below, but for now, again, uh, this need not be an action only carried out by God. It could be uh, done for other reasons by a human. Um, but I, I'll fill that in more in a bit. Um, yeah. And the third problem is this uh, touching of uh, the opponent touches Jacob's hip, as some translations have it. Now, I would suggest initially that even to translate this word touch might reflect one's prior interpretive conclusions. Yeah. Um, in fact, modern translations like the NRSV, they, 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 they translate this as strike. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's not a word that's uniquely attributed to God. So it, in other words, just seeing that word doesn't necessarily indicate that this is God. Um, it, it, it's not so conclusive. It, it's more open than that. Um, okay, so pulling that together, in short, I think that the narrator is putting before us readers an ambiguous episode, but one in which enough clues are present for us to conclude that this is a human opponent. So that's the first step in my theory. Any thoughts or questions? Read me to go on to the the next part before we stop and talk. Um, so you're saying there's a little bit more of the specifically explain the theory of Isaac, or I'm sorry that this is uh, Esau. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, yeah. before I go in to fill in why I think it's Esau, I didn't know if, there, if you had any yeah. thoughts or responses to. No, I mean, I, th I, I, think it, I think it's a fascinating theory. I really do, yeah. especially on the human level. Um, and very, uh, very interesting. In fact, when I, when I was reading uh, through your work, uh, again, uh, obviously there's a novel aspect to it, as you mentioned. Um, but I was sort of thinking, I'm surprised nobody has gone to this point yet, you know, because yeah. it, it does somewhat make sense in the narrative especially as we get to Esau here, but that there would be a, a very robust tradition of a, of a human character. And interestingly enough, I was thinking not to bring in my own research, but I can't help mm -hmm. but to see it, uh, yeah. is that as I was looking at the structuring element of Hebrew historiography, ancient Near Eastern historiography, historiography being the hermeneutical principle of divine retribution, there came a point that I couldn't not see that mm -hmm. through the eyes of the characters especially on a narratival level when we're bringing the narrative, but through the characters themselves. And, um, and I wonder even here, even if it is a human character, there may still be even with Jacob uh, sort of this um, ascription to God that he is the one who has helped him win the battle or overcome in that sense, uh, still giving it toward the divine realm in the, uh, the winning uh, aspect of it. So so it does, it could make oh, sense that it is perfectly a human character, battle mm -hmm. happening, and Jacob's involved. the one who's overcome, but God's involved in the I battle see. itself on some level, just because that's how the writers did it, 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 it very well could be. But the Esau, mm, yeah. the Esau piece is great. So this is very interesting. <laughs> well, and that's, yeah, that's a fair point right there. I like that because, yeah, I'm, I'm not necessarily, like Jacob, you know, there could be layers to what Jacob is intending when he calls this place uh, face of God. Mm -hmm. um, but minimally, yeah, that, that need not serve as an explicit identification of his opponent. Even it could be even in that, that layer that would, that's interesting yeah. to think about. So, and, and in fact, what I'm going to argue in a second would fit with with that. So, um, in, in many ways, I think so. Um, okay, well, yeah, let me go ahead and go on then, and I'll fill this out. And again, um, I, I call this the fun part, where I'm, I'm again, I'm being creative <laughs> intentionally. I'm thinking outside the box, but I'm trying to see how these details might pull together. Um, so. It, you know, if you're willing as a listener to go with me so far that this could be a human opponent, uh, and I think that resolves some of the ten the, the tensions, with the details within the text uh, more adequately. Um, if you think it's a human opponent, then the question, of course, is who? Um, and within Jacob's narrative segment from chapter 25 up to this point, by far the prime candidate is his brother Esau. I mean, immediately before and after this very episode, the focus is all on Esau. Um, his whole life has been about his rival rivalry with Esau. And so readers surely wouldn't be too surprised to learn that one of the climatic, climactic episodes in Jacob's life would involve Esau. Um, and, you know, again, the, the flow of the narrative before this, it's Esau. After this, it's Esau. This, this was one of my earlier problems with the idea that this is God. Um, it really disrupts the narrative hmm. and isn't apparent. In, in an obvious, explicit way, how it, how it informs that narrative, um, especially because immediately after this, um, you know, Jacob doesn't talk about this. When he encounters Esau, he doesn't say, 
hey, I wrestled with God. Um, and it doesn't become this, this whole conversation piece. Um, it just, it just disrupted a bit. You know, you, you, this, he's worried about Esau, then he wrestles with God, and then he's back to Esau. Um, that was one of my initial concerns was it just seemed really disruptive, unnecessarily so. Um, but anyway, so beyond the narrative impulse, though, to look for Esau in the wrestling match, I think that there are some details in the text uh, that might point in this direction. And the main ones I would highlight today have to do with language connections between the wrestling match in 32 and the meeting of the two brothers in the open in chapter 33. So uh, one of the first details, right off the bat in chapter 33, and again, this is the face-to-face open-air meeting between Jacob and Esau. We readers see that to the surprise of Jacob and to us as readers, Esau doesn't harm Jacob when they meet each other after so long, uh, but rather embraces him. Mm -hmm. All in the narrative has pointed us to imagine that there's going to be confrontation. So it's a surprising turn of events. No one questions that. Um, Now, the word used in Hebrew there for embrace is havak, Mm -hmm. uh, to to describe their embracing one another. And that's not necessarily uh, a super interesting word in and of itself. However, what really caught my attention as I was reading this text in light of the wrestling passage from uh, immediately before it, is that the key action in that wrestling passage, the, the word there translated wrestled, um, you know, the, the Hebrew word used there isn't one of the more common words that might have been used to describe their battling with one another. I think of the root from which we get the name Naphtali. Um, there, there are other more common words to describe that sort of confrontation. Uh, in, in fact, then, that passage, that wrestling passage, uses a word that only occurs once in one passage in the entire Hebrew Bible in Genesis 32. Um, and so the word used there is highly rare. And it's, you know, it's an, in, anytime that happens, uh, I, I don't want to overread, but it's interesting when, when, uh, when an author would choose a word uh, that is far uh, rarer when they could have used a more common word. Um, and so the word used to describe the wrestling is avak. Um, so, this word avak may in fact have developed from havak, um, but minimally the two play on each other. So if you're a reader and you've just read about Jacob and in in, in this opponent avak, you now read about Jacob and Esau havak. And there's the chance that that's uh, causing you to draw, make a connection in your mind uh, as you're hearing those two words. Um, But then second and most crucial, is that Jacob, in trying to appease his brother with a gift in chapter 33, says to him, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Um, that's, that's not a very common phrase uh, to, to describe a human by saying th- that seeing your face is like seeing the face of God. And again, surely is an intentional connection to the wrestling match. So here we have Jacob saying that his seeing his brother's face is like seeing the face of God. And that's the the same language, more or less, that he used to describe the opponent from the night before. So so what I'm arguing is that by making these connections at the the level of the language, uh, in others that I haven't shared here today, the narrator is guiding readers into the process of surprised discovery. So readers who were left in the dark in an ambiguity the, the night before uh, now are getting subtle clues that the one standing before Jacob is none other than Esau. Mm. Um, so again, if you'll go with me that far, returning back to the wrestling event itself, some of those difficult details I mentioned earlier. Why can the opponent not overcome? Well, he is Esau, Jacob's brother, but you know, from all indications we've had within the narrative, Esau should have been able to overcome his brother so far. Remember Jacob, the tent dweller, and Esau, the hunter. Um, So here, what this comes to represent then is he's fighting against the one whom God had sworn to protect and surprisingly is unable to overcome him. He fights all night long and cannot overcome him, presumably assuming he could have, but now he can't. And then the second detail, why does the opponent desire to flee before daybreak? Well, he is Esau and he does not want his identity to be revealed in the sunlight. Mm. So, so that's some of the, that's the, the, the gist of my 
uh, my theory there, and, it, and I can go into the difficulties that might be presented if you would like, or do you, do you have any questions or comments before we push on? Well, I have a thought as, as you know, reading your research this week, going through this talk mm -hmm. today, something just kind of hit me. I kind of would get a response from you on this. You know, you talk about how Esau is a main character in Jacob's overall his story arc. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so putting him in the focus of this wrestling could make sense. But again, it's so interesting how ambiguous this all is and uh, all the clues going on. And one thing I wonder about Jacob's life as a whole, and this kind of leads to, of course, his name change, which this whole idea of you stride with God and man, and I prevailed. What it makes me wonder is this. I wonder if the author is intentionally ambiguous in such a way where it blurs the line between human and divine between a person and God, because it makes you wonder who is Jacob really struggling and striving with in his story mm -hmm. where with, with Jacob is he is, is Esau the main person that he is wrestling with and struggling with, or is this something with God? Cause obviously as we see Jacob, one of the, one of the forefathers of the Hebrew faith, it's obviously there's clearly room where he needs to grow in, right. As this person is a deceiver to become the, the person forward, Mm -hmm. um, but, but obviously how we interact with God is directly related to how we're treating the people in our lives. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we weren't planning to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Could there be a way where the author is trying to make this ambiguous about, is this a person or is this God? Because both are important that they're trying to mm -hmm. emphasize that mm -hmm. Jacob as a whole needs to get God and people right in his life. And he's gotten neither right so far that he's mistreated his brother. He's mistreated mm -hmm. people in his lives. And he also is not someone who is trusted in God. But yet to fulfill, if you will, the plot development that God's had from the beginning with Abraham, you know, he creates a covenant, God creates a covenant with Abraham, but then also that mission is to become a family that blesses all other families. So there's this getting things right with God, getting things right with your family, and then blessing all other families. So anyway, this is all just kind of the top of my head. Do you have any kind of response to, again, I know your theory is specifically, this is emphasizing the Esau component of everything. Mm -hmm. Do you have initial responses though to this? Yeah, I, I, I think there's most of the theories that have existed so far coming from the other end, the, the, the God side of the equation, have uh, many have often, even I mentioned earlier, the idea that uh, the interpretation that Jacob might be wrestling here with the guardian angel of Esau. Uh, so even there, they're highlighting it might be a sort of non-human being, but there is the human struggle as well. I, I think there's definitely space for me coming from the other side, emphasizing that this might be a human and recognizing that the, the, the struggle is beyond just that. And I mean, even, even just the, the etiology offered here for the name change, yeah, you strove with God and with men, you have prevailed. Um, it, it's highlighting maybe something about the, the, the relationship between two of those in Jacob's own journey. So, so I definitely think there's room for, for seeing that as, a, as, as a, a layer of this text, regardless of, of one's interpretation of the opponent. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's First interesting. Question. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say this is, uh, yeah, and then you can ask that question. So, because it's right on that theme. It is interesting, too, if we move forward uh, to the sons of uh, Jacob, of course, we have uh, a lot of thing going on with the brothers as well there, <laughs> right, with Joseph. Yeah. And, and, and the Lord is, even in the text, being said to be working through it uh, yeah. in, in every yeah. aspect. So yeah. here, too, that we have sort of that that brotherly uh, contention, that 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 riv, if you will, in Hebrew, that mm -hmm. uh, that fight that's going on, uh, it's very interesting. It really mm -hmm. is. So, so again, yeah, maybe this leads back to what you were saying, Natan. Where let's say maybe this is this is a person he's wrestling with a human, but it doesn't negate that there's a that there's some sort of divine like God's involved component, just like you said oh, with Joseph later on, yeah. where you intend to harm me, but God has worked mm -hmm. this for good. Yeah. And that maybe, okay, maybe this is uh, Jacob is wrestling with Esau, mm -hmm. but God is also doing something in the midst of that yeah. human yeah. interaction. Yeah. And the odd, the narrator, maybe on purpose is not making this so straight up, like, okay, clearly here comes Esau, they wrestle, they have a fight, and then they mm -hmm. move on. But does it in this ambiguous way, because they, mm -hmm. the narrator, without telling you forwardly, wants you to say, hey, remember, God's involved in the story too. So this gets to the retribution stuff, but maybe mm -hmm. not so face forward. Um, I don't know. The more that I think about this, the more I just see how deep this goes. Um, anyway, sorry to be just verbally processing in the middle of our yeah. interview with you, but yeah. this is just, it's just interesting. Again, mm -hmm. you're obviously taking this a place that most scholarship hasn't taken it, right? We've only viewed this as we're stopping the human 
um, Reeve, again, to use your, mm-hmm. right, where we're stopping the human conflict to have a God moment. And so that theory could maybe lead us away from also focusing on this, the human aspect of things. So maybe, the, maybe your theory is a way of trying to bridge thematically this human conflict with retribution, with God's involvement. I don't know. Mm-hmm. You've given me a lot to think about. So I haven't found a landing place personally on this story yet, but it's, it's, yeah. it is fast, yeah. fascinating. No, and those are all important. And you, one, one of the other key details is what set Jacob in motion to return in the first place to the land of Canaan was in chapter 31, God speaks to him and says, return to the land of your fathers and I will be with you. Um, and so in my interpretation, then of my, my conclusions here, yeah. this text definitely becomes sort of the outworking of God's presence with Jacob to deliver him from his, his enemies. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. You know, especially where Esau, who by all, you know, by all the clues we've been given so far in the larger narrative should have been able to overcome Jacob being unable to highlights mm-hmm. God's yeah. protection and in, in, mm-hmm. in deliverance here. So a question I did want to ask you, Nathan, and I were talking about is at least it would seem to me that one of the significant parts of this wrestling scene is the end when there's a blessing And Mm -hmm. the first time that there's a name change. Now you talk about in your work, how there's a later chapter where God also specifically clearly himself says, Jacob, you're called Israel now, but you don't get Mm -hmm. the ideological explanation with it. And so this story is like, it's the first one. And there's the explanation. You're called Israel now because you've striven with, with with God and with man and you've, and you've, you know, prevailed. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's, what's the significance do you see in the difference of, let's say this is not God giving this blessing. Uh, let's say, cause mm-hmm. it's not God who is wrestling with him, or this is not some angelic, you know, divine messenger from God who maybe speaks on God's behalf, but this is Esau, you know, this is just mm-hmm. his brother. So to use your own words, you've talked about how the difference between narrator versus characters, characters may or may not be saying things that are true or not. Mm-hmm. So what significance do you see? Let's say this is Esau he's wrestled with Esau is the one blessing. How does this change uh, or affect our understanding of the blessing? Yeah. And, and this is a common, you know, a common response to this theory. Um, and my initial thoughts, uh, as I've been working through this, this, po- this possible difficulty with my interpretation, uh, well, first of all, the, the media implications, obviously, yes, have to be that, uh, in some sense, what's happening here does not necessarily represent uh, a divine blessing, it represents something else. If it's Esau, it could be him, uh, again, using darkness as a cloak to uh, pr- pretend, you know, to, to play the role that he knows his brother would want him to play in order to escape the situation. Um, but then in terms of this name in particular, yes. So uh, obviously this isn't just, you know, this, it's not like his name was changed to Mephibosheth. Uh, this is Israel. This is the name. <laughs> right, right? Yeah, so this exactly. Is important name. <laughs> so it becomes important. Um, the, uh, poor poor Mephibosheth. Mif- 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 yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. Everyone's going to get that one wrong. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so, so my initial thought it again, this is an exploratory uh, conclusion. So it's, it's, you know, I, I understand that it's just it's it's just thinking through the possible logical implications. Um, if it's Esau, then it can't it must represent something else. And so then, what could it represent? Um, in my comments, as as you did read, um, I, I highlight how uh, within the narrative in chapter thirty five, as Jacob returns to the land uh, of he's in Bethel again, uh, from at, at at which place uh, he had had the uh, the vision leaving the land. Um, which represents a nice bookend then to this phase of his life. Um, that is where using more uh, formulaic language, God rename, you know, God says, no longer shall you be Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Uh, now, obviously taking into account that, um, you know, the source critical work would, would highlight that this just represents two different sources explaining the uh, origin of the name Israel. Um, but within the narrative, as they've been put together, considering maybe maybe another layer there of, of possibility. Um, what I ultimately suggest, at least, is that what we have going on then in the wrestling match is uh, Esau giving a name to Jacob, but one which, interestingly, doesn't necessarily contain, uh, in an obvious way, positive connotation. Um, you know, scholars debate what the, uh, even the, the root of the, the name Israel is and, and, and its meaning, and there's a lot of discussion about this. Um, it's not so clear. Uh, but then whether it's inherently positive is not so clear either. Um, you know, so, so there's, there's a possibility then if this is Esau, that he's giving a name that maybe wasn't intended to be positive, 
uh, that then God uh, incorporates and utilizes as a positive uh, at a later point. Um, and, and the main basis I give for this is sort of the reverse already having happened in Jacob's life. Uh, so when he was born, he, he was named Jacob because it uh, sounded like the word for heel, right? A cave. Um, that's a pretty neutral word. Um, but then later, after he's duped his brother Esau, Esau highlights the double entendre. He says, surely you are Yaakov. You are he who supplants. Um, that wasn't the original uh, etiology offered for his name. That was, but that's obviously, you know, as we know, built into the, the verbal form of his name. Uh, so that's where Esau is sort of giving a negative spin to an otherwise neutral name. Uh, so possibly what's happening here then, Esau is giving a name uh, that is then uh, you know, give, given a positive connotation at a later point. Um, so so that, that's my initial response to that, um, in, in, you know, to make sense of it within the theory that I've proposed. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah, no, that's okay. great. Yeah, very that's good. Great. So I, you know, I don't really want to go into the theories uh, that might critique your theory because I want this to simmer for our audience. Yes, I want them to sit with this and, and let it be with the arguments that have come forth. But as we, as we sort of wrap up here, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us regarding, you know, this research and all that you went through it, doing a PhD, um, uh, et cetera, and so forth? So, so what might you like to say regarding this story uh, in particular? So. Yeah. So, you know, in particular, just, just sort of wrapping, wrapping it up, the, what I'm essentially asserting then is that in the middle of the night, as Jacob fears his brother, his brother surprises him and, and, and tries to overcome him uh, in, in a way that, uh, you know, fits with a lot of the other actions in this narrative so far by surprise, uh, you know, unexpectedly, unable to do so, though. And then he, so he flees. Uh, but then in a way that the narrative uh, is clearly woven together with the following episode, um, you know, it's as the sun is rising that Jacob encounters Esau in the daylight. And so then my interpretation of that text would be that Esau is again, uh, th this supposed reconciliation uh, is in fact a performance. Uh, he, he's, he's trying to lure Jacob back to Seir. And uh, this would, so, so he, he's still not done. He's hoping to overcome Jacob. Um, he just wants him back in his own homeland to do it. And, and this would explain then the reticence at the end of their encounter uh, when Esau wants to return home. Uh, but Jacob says he will go with him only to turn eventually to the land of Canaan. Um, so that, that's more or less what I'm making of this story. And then it, the, the wrestling passage in this frame becomes evidence that God is working to protect Jacob just as he said he would and yeah. even delivering him from the hand of his brother. Um, so that, that's more or less, you know, in a nutshell, what, what I make of it um, as a possibility. But again, I wear it lightly. I, re I recognize it's uh, uncommon ground. And so, uh, you know, there, there are critiques of this position. But uh, I think if nothing else, my bigger aim, as I said at, at the top of the, our conversation, I, I hope that this process can just model for people the, uh, how we might be open. Uh, we might open ourselves to exploring even familiar biblical texts and appreciating what's there, what's not there, and who knows, maybe stumbling onto some interesting thoughts along the way. Well, thank you for sharing your research. Uh, yeah, again, it's fantastic. Fa super fascinating. Yes. I really enjoyed reading it, and I, especially as a language person, I've really enjoyed how many, uh, how much of your argument is also built upon uh, the usage yeah. of Hebrew words, whether, mm. you know, how Hosea uses words from 32 and 33, showing that mm -hmm. he's viewing this, these scenes as a whole, um, down to the avak and chavak super interesting mm -hmm. yeah. so thank you so much for your research the yeah. last thing i wanted to do is mm -hmm. um wonder if we can go behind the scenes a little bit and tell yeah. us a little about yourself about your research your teaching um and maybe close with if people want to connect more with you and your ideas where where can they find you and now let's tell the audience of course that this is one of our colleagues yes Fred Oyer, so good friend of ours and yep. uh we are so excited to introduce our audience absolutely to doing great work and it's yeah. a great person to work with and i just personally will say by the way daniel's also just a great man a great yeah. person <laughs> again when you <laughs> so which, true to be clear, that doesn't necessarily always happen in any career space, you know, regardless of how much it's about <laughs> God or not. And so I just, I really respect the way that your students speak so highly of you. They, yeah. they, they know about your care and your passion. Mm -hmm. And um, 
when I ask students what matters most to them in a teacher, it's amazing how often passion and care are, the, are two of the top answers. And that's how they describe you. And also the way you speak about your family, uh, so much respect mm-hmm. for you, how you are as a husband and a father, um, and obviously in, the, in this profession. So you're very holistic in how you approach your life. And so it's, it's great again to work alongside you and also get to now, you know, highlight you with our, with our audience. And same to you on. I'm so thrilled to watch this journey with the, with, with your own podcast here. And uh, it's just a, fulfilling a, a unique need. And I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes and to share in, in some part with it. So yeah, always, always great to get a chance to talk. So um, well, yeah, so a little bit about me. I, I earned my PhD from Fuller Seminary. Uh, it's been a long time now. Crazy how quickly time goes about seven years now. Um, my <laughs> research and my interest, as you, know, you can see in some of what I've uh, shared with this particular text, is centered on uh, more generally reading the Bible as scripture within communities of faith. Um, and within that frame, focusing on close readings of biblical texts. Um, I, I value greatly the, the long history of critical scholarship and, uh, you know, uh, all that we can learn from source criticism, informed criticism, et cetera. Um, my own particular interests have tended to center on the, quote, final form of the text um, and, and how, you know, however we got this text as it stands, it's now put together in this way and read explicitly within communities of faith. And then uh, in conversation with those who are outside the community of faith. So um, focus a lot on uh, humility in our hermeneutics and in, in uh, how we can read this well, but read it, uh, you know, um, humbly. So mm-hmm. that's sort of generally, if I had to, had to frame my interests, um, that, that's, I, I really like narratives in particular and dynamics involved with narratives. Uh, so that's more or less where I spend most of my time. Um, in terms of where I can be found and what I'm up to, uh, I'm, I've become pretty active on Twitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> Twitter, uh, my, my name there is at Daniel Bunn Jr. And I'd love to uh, get to know people that way. And then also, um, as, as you all know, um, you know, over the last almost year, I've been co-hosting a podcast of my own with my yes. brother. Uh, it's called The Good Book Podcast. And it can be found wherever you find your podcasts. Um, and it's, again, me as a Bible person and my brother as uh, so a, a lay person uh, reading a chapter of, a bi- of the Bible one at a time, you know, having a discussion over it and sort of making our way through the Bible together. So it's been a fun conversation and we'd love to have people join if they have the time and interest. So That's awesome. Yeah, well, love it. Nathan, you have any last words for this episode? Well, I will say, uh, go to Dr. Bunn's Twitter page and check out some of his research and especially that podcast because uh, he's exceptional at what he does. And it's been such a, a wonderful time to get to know you as a colleague and uh, and obviously the friendship as well. So we will definitely have Dr. Bunn on again uh, to discuss wonderful things about Hebrew Bible. So this will be this will be a good uh, a good a guest moving forward to have on our show. So love to join in the conversation. Absolutely. We enjoyed having you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you.